Chapter Thirteen of Idiala. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Idiala by Sarah Grant. Chapter Thirteen. In the meantime, however, something decisive happened, as we afterwards learnt. It seems that after they left our neighborhood, Idiala had, by accident, made a number of small discoveries about her husband, which had the effect of destroying any remnant of respect she may still have felt for him. She found that he was in the habit of examining her private papers in her absence, and that he had opened her letters and resealed them. His manner to her was unctuous as a rule, but she knew he lied to her without hesitation if it suited his purpose. And that alone would have been enough to destroy her liking for him, for it is not in the nature of such a woman to love a man who has looked her in the face and lied to her. These things, and the loneliness he brought upon her by driving from her the few people with whom she had any intellectual fellowship, she would have borne in the old uncomplaining way, but he did not stop there. One day she drove into town with a friend who got out to do some shopping. Idiala waited in the carriage, which had stopped opposite a public house, and from where she sat she could see the little sitting room behind the bar and its occupants. They were her husband and the barmaid, who was sitting on his knee. Idiala arranged her parasol so that they might not see her if they chanced to look that way, and calmly resumed the conversation when her friend returned. She dined alone with her husband that evening, and talked as usual, telling him all she had done, and what news there was in the paper, as she always did, to save him the trouble of reading it. In return, he told her that he had been at the ironworks all day, only leaving them in time to dress for dinner, a piece of news she received with a still countenance, and her soft eyes fixed on the fire. She was standing on the hearth at the time, and as he spoke, he laid his hand upon her shoulder caressingly, but she could not bear it. Her powers of endurance were at an end, and for the first time, she shrank from him openly. How you do loathe me, Idiala, he exclaimed. Yes, I loathe you, she answered. And then, in a sudden burst of rage, he raised his hand and struck her. Idiala's determination to be faithful to what she conceived to be her duty had kept her quiet hitherto. But now a sense of personal degradation made her desperate, and she forgot all that. Her first impulse was to consult somebody, to speak and find means to put an end to her misery. But I was not there, and to whom should she go for advice? Her impatience brooked no delay. She must see someone instantly. She thought of the rector of the parish, but felt he would not do. He was a fine-looking, well-mannered old gentleman, much engaged in scientific pursuits, who always spoke of the deity as if he were on intimate terms with him, and had probably never been asked to administer any but the most formal kind of spiritual consolation in his life. The training and experience of a Roman Catholic priest, accustoming them as it does to deal with every phase of human suffering and passion, would have been more useful to her in such an emergency. But she knew none of the priests in that district, and did not think of going to them. But while she was considering the matter, as if by inspiration, she remembered something an acquaintance had lately written to her. This lady was a person for whom she felt much respect, and that doubtless influenced her decision considerably. The lady wrote, it must be convenient to be only twenty minutes by train from such a big place. I suppose you go over for shopping, etc. When you are there again, I wish you would go and see my cousin Lorimore. 
He is advisor in general at the great hospital, a responsible position. And I am sure, if you go, he will be glad to do the honors of the place, which is most interesting. Iriala had felt from the first that she would rather consult a stranger who would be disinterested and unprejudiced. This gentleman's name promised well for him, for he belonged to people whose integrity was well known, and his position vouched for his ability, and also for his age to Idiala, whose imagination had pictured a learned old gentleman, bald, spectacled, benevolent, full of knowledge of the world, wise saws and modern instances. No one, she thought, could be better suited for her purpose. And accordingly, next day, after attending to her household duties, she went by an early train to consult him. End of chapter 13